Welcome to today's webinar. We'll be covering the topic of desktop transformation and migration today and how ChangeBase can help you as you migrate to your next operating system or platform. We're going to look at a little bit of background about ChangeBase. We'll talk about the goals and benefits that the tool set brings you. We'll also look at how we fit into the migration process that you're going to go through. Briefly look at some of the um, solution components and then we'll actually have an overview demonstration of the product itself. ChangeBase has been around since 2007 has been used on hundreds of POCs around the globe and thousands of applications have been tested in all industry sectors whether that be banking and finance or um, local authorities across the globe. The tool itself provides the end user or the organization a great amount of detail into the types of issues they may have as they migrate from XP for instance to their chosen target environment. We do this using logic based checks. In our database today we have over 250,000 checks that we can ask applications to see the types of issues or problems that you may face. The real benefit to you as an end user is understanding the size of the problem and the amount of work at hand. The great thing about the tool is we do this very quickly so we take all of the applications, we load them, we test them and we give you this RAG status, a red amber green status of where you are and how your applications would fare if you were to migrate them. I'll come to the RAG status and specifically what it means in more detail shortly but in essence if an application is green it's ready for UAT. If it's amber, it has some problems that are fixable, whether those problems can be fixed manually or automatically using the change based tool set. The real upshot and real benefit to you as an organization is rather than spending your time finding these issues, we automate that process. We automatically find those issues for you. It's repeatable and it's a consistent set of checks to make sure that you're getting very good results. Finally, we provide a great deal of automation. So rather than doing something manually, why not let the tool do that work for you and let your valuable packaging resource focus on the real problems that need fixing manually. To give you an example, for Windows 7, 95% of the issues that we find, we can fix automatically. And as well as automatically fixing applications, we can actually help you automatically sequence applications to virtual platforms. Now what are the key benefits of the change based tool? Well it's very easy to use, it's simple, simply a case of taking your applications and drag and drop them onto the workbench or if you have thousands of applications then we have bulk loading tools to allow you to quickly and seamlessly load all of your applications into the tool. Once you've loaded those applications it's very quickly allows you to assess those applications for any target platform. So for instance, if you were migrating to Windows 7, you were going to have 64-bit hardware, you were interested in App V, and you had Office 2010 in mind, this would be very simple for you to understand any types of issues that you may face and get that red, amber, green status of your applications. Now of course, once you understand the issues, it's then time to start thinking about fixing them we fix in a specific manner we allow you two options the first option is to follow an industry standard of creating what we call a transform an MST file if this is an off-the-shelf application we don't want to invalidate its warranty or its subscription so this stops you from actually modifying the underlying MSI or application but if it's not an off-the-shelf application and something that's homegrown or no longer supported why not modify the underlying source and the tool gives you lots of flexibility in that sense it is a comprehensive workbench whether you are moving to a desktop environment whether you want to go virtual or your applications are going to the cloud or you have web applications that you need to understand any issues you may have as you migrate away from IE6 
to I8 or I9, for instance. We give you options to understand all of the issues that you may face, no matter where you are in that transformation process. And finally, once an application has been remediated, fixed, migrated, for instance, what about its ongoing management? So you've migrated all of your applications. How do you handle change? We understand change will happen on a constant basis, whether this is due to users wanting new applications, things becoming unsupported, Microsoft rolling out new patches. All of these types of things will happen on a day-to-day -day basis. The tool will actually help you manage those particular aspects of your projects and your deployments as you go through the future. What have we seen over the last six or seven years? What we're finding is, in essence, the migration process has become much more complex. When we move from XP to Windows 7, we're not just thinking about an OS change as we were when we migrated to XP. We now have to take into consideration virtual environments, the integrations with the office suites, the change of browser technology. So rather than just testing for one thing, i.e. the compatibility with the OS, we're now thinking of many different aspects and you could almost say that the migration process has um, become four times as tricky as a minimum. Now, what we found using doing our testing, and this is a great example you have on your screen now, we looked at 3,700 applications. Now we loaded these 3,700 applications in three days. We then took three hours to assess them. So we've actually done a body of work, automatically tested those applications and got some very quick results. This is the type of thing that would take you over a year to do manually and we're doing this in days. What results did we see? Well, we seem to find that talking to um, the customers and the prospects that we engage with on a daily basis and our partners, the feedback we get from the field is around about 15 to 20 percent of applications will have red issues when you come to migrate them. Now this is very interesting and in this instance we had 19 percent of the applications. The key question is what are you going to do with those applications? Are you going to virtualize those applications because you can't migrate them away from XP? Are they virtualizable? Will you have to have them in a terminal services type remote environment that you're going to connect to? All of these questions are the things that you want to think about when you have red applications. It may be that the app owner says, well, this particular application we can retire because there's an upgrade available or there's another application that does the same thing that we can use instead. But you need to start to seriously think about what are you going to do with the red applications. And we're giving you some options by providing you information regarding what those issues are and which specific application or components within an application are affected by those red issues. Then we're finding somewhere between 40 and 60% of applications will be amber. Now amber is a very interesting um, color in that an amber application will go green, i.e. it is fixable, whether it's fixable automatically using AOK -OK, or whether it's fixable manually by your packaging or remediation team. And then we find that roughly around 25 to 30% of applications will have no issues and just need to go straight into your user acceptance testing process. Now with the change base tool, you've got a couple of things to think about here. Once you've loaded those applications and you've tested them, you can do some automatic fixing of course. So if you now look to the after fixing column on this um, presentation, what you can see here is 75% of the applications after fixing were ready for UAT and only 6% remained amber. So what we've done here is 44% of the amber issues have been fixed automatically leaving only 6% needing fixing via your team manually. So you've just reduced the amount of work that you would need to do traditionally on your applications. The red applications remain red 
This is due to the fact that we do not fix red issues. Red issues actually need a change of source. Maybe this means an upgrade via the vendor. So we can't specifically fix those issues. The main types of issues that we come across on a daily basis will be things that are either specifically no-goes or things that are best practice or issues that we can fix. The top ranking issues that we see, as you can see from the chart at the bottom, are things like legacy help files, where we have to ship the help32 component to actually allow the application to be deployed, or things such as UAC um, issues. Things that would cause an elevated privilege requirement. So, for instance, the user to run the application would be asked for the username and password when the application was deployed. And in most instances, they'll have no access to those that information, so therefore the application is not going to run. These types of issues we can fix, and as you can see, um, the top ranking issues are here. Something like UAC, we can fix 93% of the issues. The other 7% will require, require some manual fixing in that they'll have, for instance, an internal manifest that we can't modify because, again, that would mean a change in source. Now, how does AOK fit into the migration process? Typically, we get that call or get involved in a project when an organization understands a couple of things. One would be their desired strategy. Well, what are we going to migrate to? What is our transition? Are we going from a desktop to a virtual environment? Are we just going to migrate from Windows XP to Windows 7? Is it some form of hybrid? Are we going to virtualize some applications and some applications are going to be on the desktop? These are the types of discussions that an organization will have had. They've normally identified the majority of the applications that they're thinking about migrating. They may have through the discovery process identified the app owners and have the install scripts etc and at that point they normally want to talk to us to understand the size or any types of problems that they may face as they start to migrate now a great scenario here is and what a lot of organizations will do is take all of their applications whether they're MST file MST MSP or MSI files so standard industry standard applications or whether they're non-supported or non-standard applications, things that were homegrown, things that were um, built by the dev team, for instance. You take everything, you load it into the tool, and you assess it. And via that assessment process, you then get that rag status. So straight away, you can start to have the internal discussions allowing you to make some decisions. Which applications can be migrated? which applications are going to have red issues and we need to think about a strategy for those applications which applications should we no longer license should we retire this application or replace it with an upgrade all of these types of discussions can be had off the back of this assessment of your applications once that assessment is complete the next phase of course is start remediating the applications some of this will be done automatically using the team tool and the remainder could be done manually and that in essence will be the focus of your project. Now once you've done that remediation and fixing of those applications, you then get to some options around deployment. Am I going to deploy this application as an MSI? Am I going to deploy this application for instance as an app VSFT file, so a virtual application? You're going to start to make these um, choices and within the solution set we can automate a lot of these steps so we could automate for instance the creation of that sft file rather than doing it manually but in essence the tools giving you options where, where do i want to get to and how am i going to get there and then finally once you have deployed those applications we then start to think about the ongoing management on a day-to-day -day basis of our app estate when microsoft roll out a new patch or an update we will test that patch we will send you a new set of checks or reports that you can test against your application set or your desktop allowing you to make decisions can i roll this patch out if i roll it out which applications may be affected is it something i should do now from the slide in front of you hopefully you can see that the tool set is modular in essence, depending on where you are in the migration process, you're going to use a different subset of the tools. The tool is all-encompassing, whether you're using test it and convert it to load and test your applications against the Windows platforms, or whether you're interested in a virtual environment. 
using um, Virtualize it. Whether you're thinking about Office or web-based applications, all of the components are there for your use. And then you can see to the far right, you have things such as Fix It, allowing you to fix applications, and of course, be ready it and manage it for the sequencing and the managing of your applications on an ongoing basis. So it's a very, very comprehensive set of capabilities that you can bring to bear on your project. Now I said earlier I would talk around red, amber, green and just to make sure we're all understanding exactly what I mean when I say red, amber, green I'm just going to go through it again one more time. Red, now this is an application that would generally require the actual code to be modified and these types of red issues are issues that we cannot fix using the tool. What we can do is allow you to understand which issues you have and a classic example for instance is we may have flagged a particular driver or a particular DLL that is not going to be supported on your target environment so for instance it will not function correctly if you virtualize the application but you may find that it's a particular component that you're not actually using it could be a print driver that's no longer needed so in essence we're giving you the information to make those choices you may decide that I'm going to test the application and I'm going to add that component to my UAT because I understand it's not going to function correctly and I want to see the level at which it will function if it will function at all. As I said earlier an amber application these are the types of issues that can be fixed they can be fixed automatically or they can be fixed manually so it's the type of work your packaging team will work on if you're working manually or the types of issues that we will fix with the tool. And finally Amber apps will go green and if an application is green it's ready for UAT. The final thing I want to touch on before we start to look at the application itself is the topic around web-based applications and IE8 and IE9 and the types of things that we're seeing. So if we think around IE there's two main focuses we, sh we should think about. One is how will an application that is reliant on IE fare when you migrate to IE8 or IE9? There's a couple of things you want to think about. One will be is presentation type issues. Will the style sheets work correctly? Will all my buttons still be there? Will it still have the same look and feel? Is that button still on the screen or is it actually gone to the left or to the right? These are the types of things that you may visually see. You may have some broken links, of course. Those are the things you're not going to see until someone clicks on a link. And then you have the whole operational type scenarios. I press the button. I hit submit. The data should be transmitted to the ordering system, but the data is not getting there. What's causing that um, process to break? So these are more operational type issues. There's a couple of ways we look at this or these types of scenarios. We think about this statically and we think about this dynamically. Statically, I would think if a website is static, i.e. there's not a lot of interaction, I click on a link, I go to a page, I read some data, then what we would do is we may crawl that domain so we can take a URL, we drag and drop the URL, we load that, and we do some testing. Similarly, we take the source folder from your internet site and we drag and drop that onto the workbench and that will give us all of the information that we require. But what we found in the field, so working with organizations such as Vodafone, we found that actually you need some more information. There are a lot of websites that have embedded um, web applications single sign-on authentication pages and of course if you do a static analysis any time that you come to a point where there's a interaction with the user and that website you kind of stop so if you change domain the web crawl would stop if someone had to sign in the web crawl would stop at the specific point where the user would need to sign in so what we developed is what we call client-side capture and that allows us to capture what a user is doing on a day-to-day -day basis on websites or on the different websites or web applications that he uses 
or he or she uses on a day-to-day -day basis. The architecture in essence is no install on the end user's machine, a small proxy server locally, the tool set deployed locally and what it allows us to do is capture all of the traffic coming back as a user starts to use the websites on a day-to-day -day basis. We can exclude or include particular sites, we can specify when to start and stop this capture process, but it gives us a very uh, holistic overall view of specifically what a user is doing on a day-to-day -day basis and then allows us to test for all of the types of issues that he may encounter or may not encounter or even visually see dur during his usage of those particular websites. Now we capture a lot of data from the loading of applications, websites, etc. And all that data needs to be viewed. Now you'll see when I use the tool that you can view that data either within the tool or specifically you can view the data in reports. There are many types of reports that we um, can provide, whether that be high level summaries or detailed reports of specific issues. You get a very detailed understanding of all of your issues. We can provide um, estimates of cost and effort and we can also help you determine what is the best deployment strategy moving forward what is the best virtual platform how many issues will I have when I move to Windows 7 can I deploy this application on a 64-bit piece of hardware all of these types of problems will be highlighted by the tool so in summary and I hope you'll see this when we jump into the tool it's going to be very simple for you to understand the types of issues. You're going to reduce a lot of the time and effort, so of course reduce your cost. You're going to have comprehensive understanding of all the types of issues that you may face. You will be able to automate a lot of the steps, again reducing some of the time and effort involved. And because we are continually updating our checks, so those 250,000 rules, you get a consistent fix. You also get an audit trail of the types of issues you have fixed over time. Right now I'm going to jump into the product and give you an overview of AOK -OK itself. Now this is the AOK -OK workbench. You can see under the reports area these are the things that I want to check for. I currently have 25,000, just over 25,000 rules in my database. Below are the applications that I want to test and to the left this is almost um, my process. I want to load my applications, run tests against them, and then I want to do some form of fixing if I find issues. So the first thing I want to do is show you how I loaded these applications. So let's load some applications. So in this folder we have some applications. I've got some MSIs, I've got a few installers, and what I'm going to do is load some applications and then I'm going to do some testing on those applications. And once I've loaded the applications, I hit load it, and you'll see this will start the loading process. Now what's going to happen is, we're going to do a dependency scan on each and every application, meaning I do not have to install the application to understand its issues. So you can see we're loading these applications very quickly. The dependency scan is going to look for APIs that are used by that installer or called by the installer, path variables, com information. We're going down to around six levels within the installer to make sure we understand everything we need to know about that installer. And that allows us to load that installer, create a temporary MSI that we're going to test against, and then capture all the information in our database. Now, one of the applications I loaded wasn't an MSI. It was actually an installer. That installer, we have a free utility that allows me to take any type of application, whether it be an MSI, whether it be an installer, and load it into the workbench. So I'm just logging into a virtual machine, and inside the virtual machine, we've placed the application. So the application has automatically been taken by the workbench placed inside a virtual machine 
and a free utility that is a set of filter drivers allowing me to capture the install process. Now the great thing about this, this is not a before and after, this is actually physically capturing everything I do, or everything the application does, whether it be a script I'm running, whether it be an installer that calls another installer, we will capture all of that, take that data, export it, once it's been exported we will create a MSI, that MSI will then allow me to load it into the workbench, so you'll see here that the workbench will revert back to the snapshot, so if I wanted to load another application it will give me that option. It will export the data and then we'll do a dependency scan as we did with the other applications and we'll load that application into the workbench for testing etc. And now you can see we've done the export, we're creating that MSI and we've loaded this application into the database and here we go you can see the application has been loaded. Now the next thing I want to do is do some testing. So I'm now going to test all of the applications. So I've now got 18 packages in my database. I need to tell the workbench what I want to test against. I'm interested today in Windows 7, 32-bit and 64-bit. I'm interested in App V. I'm also interested in Office 2010. Now I've selected what I want to test for, I then hit the run it command, which is, means run my checks against my applications. Now whilst this is running, let's look at the types of things we're going to be checking for. Now these are what we call report groups. So it's a group of checks that are specific to a particular environment, platform, or in this instance, Office 2010. The checks that we're looking for around for Office 2010 are APIs that are no longer supported, components that are no longer supported in Office 2010, different file formats that have been deprecated, i.e. still not supported, registry settings that may have changed, new 64-bit components. For App V, you can see we've got a different types of checks, but if you notice there's a difference with App V. With App V you can see that we have cog icons. Now a cog means we have an automatic fix for that specific issue. You'll also see that for every type of check there is a more info column. You don't need to be a packaging expert to use this tool. This more info will tell you why we're doing the check, what types of issues will be presented if you have this check, and also the types of next steps that you can actually enter into. So what should I do next? For App V, things like shell integration, the DCOM components, non-supported drivers, multi-line registry, these are some of the things that we're checking for. For 64-bit, you'll see there are no fixes, so if you have a 64-bit issue, it will flag red. That means that particular component cannot be fixed, as we said earlier. Things we're looking for are things such as 16-bit components, APIs that are 16-bit and no longer um, supported. Now, in a very short time, you can see that actually I've tested 18 packages against all of those different environments, so against Win7, Windows 64-bit, App V, and Office 2010. And I've now been given my first indication of what my applications look like as I try and migrate them. Now, the first thing to think about here is we've got one application that has no issues, so it was ready for UAT. We have quite a few applications that are amber, so they have some issues, but those issues are fixable. And we have some applications that have got quite a bit of red. So let's dig into a couple of these applications. Now here's a classic example. We've got an old version of Adobe Acrobat. You can see from here that, as I said earlier, I've got some amber in the office suite. So I've got some components that this application is reliant on that are no longer supported. And we have a registry setting that is no longer supported. But more importantly, and my main focus, is Windows 7 today. Now, although 
I can fix this legacy help file. You can see for the legacy help file components, we've got one HLP component that's going to run in this application, and we could deploy the help32 component to make sure this application would run and be deployable. The problem we have, though, is we do have some red issues. And what highlights the problem here is these are old kernel mode drivers. So these are drivers that are no longer supported. So I'm starting to look at this application thinking, well, I'm not going to be able to fix this application. I should talk to the app owner and see if we can get a new version or an upgrade to a new version of Adobe. Because if you look for 64-bit, we've got the same types of issues. We've got the same um, kernel mode drivers, but we've also got some 16-bit drivers. And of course, they're not going to work in this 64-bit um, environment. Whilst we're here, let's have a quick look at another application. So we've got an old version of the workbench. And this one's more interesting um, in the sense that I have app V issues and I have Windows 7 issues, but all of the issues for this application are fixable. So I've got one resource protected DLL that the tool can help me fix. And you can see here, we get some more info about why this has been raised as an issue and is specifically what we can do to, to isolate this component. For Windows 7, we've got some best practice type issues. So we've got some security issues that need to be um, fixed. As part of the installer on Windows 7, it's going to see things like install, uninstall, rollback, for instance. These are going to cause the end user to have to have elevated privileges to run the application. So of course, we can fix those automatically. Now, this is one way of looking at the data. Another way of looking at the data, of course, is to look at reports. Now, reports will give us great high-level information, and it can provide us with detailed information depending on what we want to look at and specifically what we're interested in. So what I'm doing now is just running some reports in the background. I'm then going to look at those reports, and then we can have a, a great overview of the types of issues we're going to face. So whilst that's running, let's start looking at the summary report. Now the summary report is very interesting. It tells me everything I've just done. So it tells me I've run 53 reports against 18 packages. I had 11 packages that had red issues. I had six amber and one green. And as I go further into this report, it gives me more detail. So in this example here, you can see that I've got for office, I had no red, but I had four amber and 14 green for app V. I've got 10 red, 5 amber, 3 green. And if we go down to Windows 7, um, two of the applications had no issues on Windows 7. 13 had amber issues that are fixable, and we have three packages that had red issues. And as we go further into this report, it will break that down and give us more detail, i.e. specifically what passed, what failed, what's going to give me issues. But what I want to do quickly is just look at this report slightly in more detail on Windows 7. Some of the things that are interesting here are not only will it tell you the number of packages for a specific issue, so the number of packages affected by a specific issue, it also tells you how much fixing we have for that particular issue. And in this instance, we've got 105 issues that we can fix automatically. Now, if you start to tally these issues up, and we can also add things like the effort and cost per issue to start to give you a real understanding of the ROI involved here. But the real important thing to me is 93% of the issues that we found for these applications can be fixed automatically. Now, as well as the summary reports, we have a couple of other reports um, that I'm going to show you. One is called a profile report. The other one is called a profile report post-fixing. So it's a before and after view of my applications. So what we have here is, to the left, my packages. Across the top, we have the specific platforms I was thinking about migrating to. And the current status of all of the applications that were tested. So as you can see here, we've got, um, for App V, quite a bit of red on some of the applications. So this tells me that maybe App V is not the best suited for my applications. Maybe I might want to think about another um, virtual environment. For Windows, we've got three applications that are currently red and a lot of amber. But what are the applications going to look like after we've done the automatic fixing? So this is the view of the applications after fixing. You can see now we've only got three applications 
on Win7 that we want to look at in more detail and look into their specific issues. And we've got one, well actually we've got two amber issues. So now we're starting to get an understanding of where we are, where we can get to very quickly, and then the next set of steps that we need to go to will be provided by more detailed reports. And to give you an example of a detailed report, you can have reports that tell you for every application, show me the specific issue. So for instance, we've got some um, DCOM issues for this particular application and it will highlight number of issues and all of the specific issues for that application. So as well as running reports, of course, the next thing we want to think about is fixing applications. So what I'm going to do is take the change-based application and I'm going to fix all of its issues. Now I don't have to fix all the issues, I may only decide I want to fix one or two issues, but in this instance I'm going to fix all of the issues and all I need to do at this point is say fix it. And then what the tool's going to do is, you remember at the beginning when we scanned the applications, that allowed us to create a temporary MSI that we use for testing purposes. What we're going to do is compare the original MSI with the one that we've just loaded for testing. And what we're also going to do is, as we've run the reports, we know all of the things we need to change on that temporary MSI to make it deployable. So what we do is we compare the original with the temporary and all of the fixes required. And the difference we place inside an MST file. Any extra data, supplementary data, so security manifests, help32 files for instance, we will place in CAD files. If you were going to um, overwrite the application because it wasn't off the shelf and it was homegrown, what we would then do at that point is create a backup. So we would back up the original before we overwrote it and then we would also create the CAD files etc. Here you can see the output, so I've opened the source folder you can now see that we've rolled up all of the transforms. So if there was an existing transform for XP, we'll roll that up into one transform so the application still remains backward compatible with XP. We've also created the supplementary CAD files that will have the security manifest, etc. within it. You now have a deployable set of components that you may want to package together or you could deploy as, it, as is. Finally, we talked about not only being able to deploy an application as an MSI, but we could also deploy an application as a virtual application. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the application I've just fixed and I'm going to sequence it. And it's a very simple process. You define what you want to sequence the application to. In this instance, I want to sequence to app V. Once you've defined what application format you want to create you then simply hit this vredit component and that will start the sequencing now what we do and the question I'm asked a lot is if you sequence the application to app v for instance will it be supported still we've not created anything here um, what we've done is automate a process we've taken the sequencing agents and engine it's inside a virtual machine that I'll show you shortly and then we've just automated all of the manual steps. So rather than you doing it manually, we've automated that step. And the great thing about automation, of course, is if you can automate a step, you can speed it up. Now we are currently seeing a throughput of 100 applications a day per image. Now, of course, if you scale this up, if I have 1,000 applications, I run 10 images, and then I can start to automate this process. In this instance, I'm gonna watch this and babysit it. You can get this to run silently, and you'll see that I'm not actually going to click on the screen. Everything is being automated. We're using the um, sequencing wizard. The sequencing wizard is doing all the work. And then the output files will be created locally on my machine, ready for deployment. So whilst that's running, the last thing I need to do is also think about web-based applications. So I'm going to come back to this shortly, but what I wanted to do is, um, if we open a browser, 
and you can see we've got a website here and it's a trip log of some lucky people who got to tour the world in this Range Rover if I take the same website and let's open the same website in IE for instance and we'll see if the same website actually presents correctly in IE so this will give us a good example of the types of issues that you may face so we're looking at the same website but you can see that it's telling me we have errors so what we want to do is actually look at those specific errors so let's go back to um, the workbench and see if we how we get on with our virtualization process so you can see the application here is just finishing it's just been launched so it's the final part of the sequencing once this is finished we're going to look at the output and then we'll look at the testing of websites which you'll see is very similar to what you've just seen the last piece it's doing here is just creating all the shortcuts etc so now that's done you can see it's just made the folder within the folder you can see the F SFT file and all the other components have just appeared as the sequencing process is stopped and here are all the icons so here is my freshly sequenced chains based application in an app v format so as I said the final thing I wanted to think about was um, web based applications one of the great things about AOK is you can have multiple databases with different information in so here I have a database it's full of um, information specifically we've got a lot of um, web-based data so what I want to do is load the website we, we saw earlier once we've um, loaded it so it's a simple process of drag and drop as before one thing I want to do is get the application to actually analyze web files I don't use that when I'm doing the normal desktop applications at which point again I just need to say load it you can load from word documents you can drag and drop directly or you can bulk load application so what it's doing now is scanning and extracting the data from that particular website so it's doing a web crawl once it's done the web crawl it will write the data to the database and then we can do the specific analysis and then look at the results so it's just doing the final piece here and then you'll see the sequence is exactly the same as we did previously whilst it's just waiting to complete you can see I've got IE8 and IE9 here and I've also got another set of reports that help me understand if I should look at a website statically or dynamically so we've loaded the URL next thing I want to do of course is run my checks against all of the web sites that I've got within the system again load it run it we don't do any fixing we only do testing for web type um, data so you'll see there are no cog icons the types of things that we're looking for for IE9 you can see we're looking for um, star sheet declarations i.e. the ones that are non-compatible the ones that are partially compatible we're looking how we handle certain components we're looking at properties in the style sheet so these are the kind of presentation type issues we've also got things such as um, static text so how will the static text work in a particular environment again more info type of problem how it will affect an application and then you have the more um, operational type issues as I talked about earlier so again we're looking um, for Java we're looking for API's all of the components to see whether for IE8 or i 9 specifically you have any problems so let's take a second and look at the results so you can see that we did find some issues if we look in IE at that particular website it just tells us we have some browser version problems but you can see with deeper analysis we can see for each type of platform I'm running IE8 and for IE8 there were some case sensitive issues 
that it found some encoding problems there are some deprecated functions and it's telling me this down to the line and column and the particular web URL so it's given me all of the information that I require to pass to the developer of this particular website but again the key focus is here whether it's a desktop application a virtual application or a web app or a website it's the same type of process load the data test the data look at the results take steps so thank you for your time today that was an overview of AOK -OK. hopefully you saw that it is very simple it is a fast way of looking at looking for issues and then doing some form of remediation or taking next steps. We have a very comprehensive set of tools allowing you to focus on all of the types of problems you will face as you go through your transition. Quickly fix the problems that you find and use your valuable resources where it's required and get that consistent fix or that consistent remediation to make sure that you're always getting very good results. Thank you for your time.